I'm going to sort of like start by asking um, a sort of like a question to all of you, and I'd like to kind of go one by one um, with this question. Tell us about your journey into filmmaking, and was uh, was uh, politics a driving force behind it? And I'm going to start with. Yeah, I came to filmmaking through theatre. Um, I was a theatre, I still am a theatre director, but I was making just theatre for um, probably like 10 years, I think, before I started into film. Um, was, was politics, I mean, yes, <laughs> obviously, obviously it was. The, you know, the body is political in spaces, sort of. Um, without its consent, so you either kind of like lean into that or you can lean out of it. I don't know what that experience would be like, but I leaned into it. Um, uh, so yeah, but I think my um, political practice, I have, I have made work that I think verges on agitprop, and that has always like, really interested me. Um, I think that probably the politics in my practice has always come through the politics of making and who makes work and how that work is made. Um, and I think that at the moment it is particularly interested in time and care and how that intersects with both people and um, environmental and ecological concerns. But I think, I think weirdly if you come from theatre you're sort of more aware of that because there's less money. So you know, so you're just like, do I really want this thing? And sort of, you know, committing to it <laughs> earlier is, is a good thing. So um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think sometimes people have called my work political in a way that made me um, really uncomfortable only because um, a little bit like I was saying earlier um, about horror I sort of think that the phrase political um, has slightly been co-opted in, in ways like there's a certain type of white woman who calls my work political that makes me want to kill myself um, do you know what I mean so like to me it maybe feels less political than it feels to other people. I feel like I'm just expressing myself. That feels compatible for some people. Fine, whatever. Uh, sure, I, I, I just got into film as a film lover. So as a kid, I was just obsessed with film and cinema. Um, it was a way, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but it was a way of escape for me. So it was really a way of, of being absorbed into another world that wasn't my own. Uh, and my own world at the time was, was full of a lot of violence, so for me it was a, an escape uh, from that. So I had always wanted to make sort of fiction, big fiction films, that was my childhood dream. But it was only much later that I got into, that I started becoming political as a person and then became interested in making political films. So, I mean, quite late in, in my life, I would say, uh, when I became at least aware of being Palestinian and what that meant. So f for a lot of Palestinians, um, especially in the diaspora, they might be familiar with the experience of being raised to be f pretty apolitical and actually not even identify as Palestinian because uh, you want to integrate into Britain, for example, and so being Palestinian is, is, is a way of marking you out. Uh, and also my father's family who had been through wars and living as refugees, so it made sense to raise their son to be, you know, take, take the easy way. So it was quite later, I would say in my teens, that I started to understand what it meant to be Palestinian, and then when it came to my first film, it ended up being a, a documentary because I had become, I would say, politicized, and it became a documentary about a very political subject. So there was a definite turning point, but the films were always very subtle in a way, so I, I was always interested in being very political, but the film itself not being a political with a capital P film. And actually one of the goals I always, I always had and still have, because I see the media around the Arab world, let's say in general, um, was to complicate the narrative. So I always had this idea that the simplified narrative, especially in, in mainstream media, was very, um, was very false. And so the best way that I could deal with it was, was to complicate it, to add layers of complexity and nuance, and et cetera, et cetera. So what you end up with, for me at least, is a very humanist story, but with this woven into it a very profound love uh, and interest in politics, I hope, if the film works. 
Um, yeah, I guess I grew up like probably like a lot of you, um, aware of being of a lot of stories and a lot of things that weren't told. That you know, this question of representation or what other stories and realities are um, are told and what isn't told, and I think that that's a thing that's driven me for a long time. Uh, when I was younger. And then really when I, I started making films somewhat accidentally but in a very, very political space because I was, uh, I'd, I'd done a master's in journalism. I'd worked as a translator. And really my original interest was translation, um, which is part of this like concern of making things available that people don't know about because they're not in there. They're not in English, frankly. Um, and yeah, I, I got an internship at Al Jazeera English in 2009, so I happened to be working there in a very intense political moment, and to sort of get dragged into this kind of, um, all these things that were happening, and to becoming a documentary maker. But it was not a lifelong plan, it is kind of something that just happened to me. Um, but it did mean that the work that I was drawn to was um, happening on sort of very, um, strong kind of political fault lines, mm -hmm. if you like. And that has sort of, yeah, taken me, I guess, to a point now where I'm maybe more questioning in different ways of, um, of stories and representation and things. But I think that that's how I started. It was very political. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, you know, in terms of uh, sort of like the themes of, um, so like the political, I think I've got lots of questions, and actually, I think it's always better to actually just like ask the questions rather than reading off the paper. Um, and I think there's a kind of element of like the sort of like moral imperative of political um, of political filmmaking that there's a, like a sense of urgency. I think even if it's something that is in the past, there's a sense of urgency in political make and filmmaking. For for you guys, what has been the sort of like driving force in terms of your work? Like, what has been the um, the sort of like the struggles or the conversations or the themes that have really like um, been sort of like pushing you forward in terms of your work. I'm gonna go to Nadia on this. Yes, okay. Sorry. Um, you can answer it any which way you want. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because I think I'm somebody who sits at an intersection of identity and being both black and Muslim, um, but also I feel like when I immigrated to this country. 20 years ago, 21 years ago, um, I was experiencing minorityness for the first time, right? Like I'd grown up somewhere where being black and Muslim made you part of the majority, which is not to say there are not huge, huge, huge problems with both colorism and tribalism in Sudan. Um, but, and so I feel like I've always had like a slightly um, objective view on what I, um, the kind of minority politics in, in, in Britain mm -hmm. and therefore I find them like <laughs> fairly, like, I still find them kind of interesting because I'm like, what? You know, it's like, we look the same but like there's this kind of like uncanny difference between um, the two of us. I sort of think that um, I'm not interested in um, picking my scabs for people to enjoy. I don't mind picking other people's scabs, <laughs> like that's fine. <laughs> um, but uh, I sort of think that I want to protect myself in the filmmaking because I think that there are, um, you know, the road to heaven is paved with filmmakers who only made one film mm -hmm. because, um, particularly when we require autobiographical elements, you know, like, but where are you? Where are you in your film? Um, I'm out the door, <laughs> I'm in the pub, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's about this guy. Um, so I sort of, um, or, and I think particularly as somebody who has felt the long arm of the law um, before, but also met the kind of violence of the critical community. I remember um, Nick Cohen once, once wrote an op-ed about me where he talked about wanting to rip me liberal limb from liberal limb, and I'm like, Okay, cool. I mean, like, and that is actually, I think, a lot of the violence that sits under um, making work in this country. Anyway, uh, so actually, I think the older I get, the more I'm like, I do want to protect myself, um, and I want to protect the other people 
who are making this film or making this play um, with me. Sometimes I do that through irreverence, like sometimes I find a way to distance myself from the trauma. So you're like, if you've experienced the trauma, you know, but you don't have to watch it happen on screen, do you know what I mean? There's like a knowing, empathetic connection between us, but I don't need to pick our scabs <coughs> on screen. Um, if anybody has ever seen uh, the work of the extraordinary African-American filmmaker Fonza Woods, who only ever made two short films, uh, her entire over is 25 minutes, um, but she talks a lot about that. She talks a lot about, you know, comedy, or, or just irreverence, I actually don't mean comedy, I just mean like a lightness of touch. And being the thing that she felt was her reaching out to other black people and being like, actually, maybe it's not my job to give you a like, terrible traumatic time at the, at the cinema. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I find that through genre, um, sometimes I just find it through comedy. But um, yeah, for me, I'm sort of like less interested in, I think it's, I think it's Melvin Van Peebles who is like, why would I hold up a mirror to the African American experience? Like, why would I do that when we know what we, go through. And I, and I think that's really interesting because I think there are loads of people who would want to hold up a mirror and that's totally what they want. Like, that's all fucking stare at it. But his old point is like, we know that happens. So what am I gaining from watching this? And I, and I think that sometimes with, you know, like, I love Debbie Tucker Green. I think Debbie Tucker Green is one of the best artists that this country has produced. And, but I was really interested in her next <coughs> piece, If I, which I originally saw as a play and, and then saw as a film where it was the first time where I was like, wow, this is not for me. This is for white people. You know, this is to make white people feel bad about the history of slavery in the UK and the US. But I've never so like acutely felt that I didn't need to be there because I was like, I know all these things. Um, so I think that's the thing about making political work is it's like, whose narrative are you feeding? And, it, and it's awful because that can be your lived experience. That can be like totally accurately your lived experience, but you are still feeding a narrative for that. You know, maybe I don't. Maybe I just don't want to be part of it. I don't know. <laughs> no, that makes sense. I think you know, really, it's just up for interpretation, and also just like up for what your values are. And I think that there's just a multiplicity of basically everyone kind of has a film in them. Whether or not they make it is kind of a different situation. Um, and that, like, just thinking about um, you know the idea of like picking at an open scab. It's like you don't have to you know, make, sacrifice yourself at the feet of like the film industry. You can make films that you're interested in, explore things that you're interested in without having to do stuff that, 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 that you're expected to do. Mm. As a black Muslim filmmaker, you can explore things that are a bit subversive, like with white girls, it's like, it's something that is like unexpected. It's like, well, you have these resources and make this kind of film. Like, no, no, let me make this film. And I think that's always really powerful just to kind of subvert that. Um, and that, as a really, really, um, really, really like thoughtful response, thank you. And maybe you can kind of explore like what are the sort of like, maybe slightly differently, um, in terms of like, you know, your work as a filmmaker, what what do you think is really urgent? Like what is like the urgent thing in your work currently that you're thinking about politically mm -hmm. or sort of like themes that have sort of like come full circle in your work? I'm a bit, I'm sort of the opposite in the sense that I really do pick at my scabs and, I, and I'm not sure that it's a very healthy thing to do, so I totally respect your strategy. Uh, but I, th it's also because the reason I came into film was just this complete uh, obsession and love, really deep, profound love for cinema. You know, it was something, because it was such a part of my childhood as a survival uh, technique that I, I adore it, it's such an immense part of my life that it's, it's impossible for me to make a film that I don't sort of throw my entire uh, life and every day into and then I sort of finish as this really um, obsessive but also exhausting um, cathartic experience and, it, and it's not, I know that it's not a very healthy approach but um, it does mean that in a way every film is is about me in one way or another, you know. And I and I try and say that without sounding too egotistical, but it's about me in a sense that, um, you know, the last film I made is, for example, it's about a family in in Burma that work in an oil field. So it's not about me in any way, but in fact, uh, you know, the film is about a father and a son. It's a documentary, and. 
I don't always know it at the time, but when I finally finished the film, I had a, a really revelatory understanding of my father's life and why he did what he did through this family that I have absolutely nothing in common with, but really, I think, created a very loving relationship with over the years that we filmed together and they allowed us into their home and we spent time with them. So there's, I think at the heart of the political filmmaking project, for me, there's always something I desperately want to understand about myself. And that's what drives me to make those films. And, and I think that's what keeps me there because it's very easy to, to, to quit, right? When you're in the middle of something so difficult, it would be very easy to say, this is too difficult, this is too hard, especially for someone like you, from what I understand, and, and me, which is that we're not making the sort of political cinema that people would expect. So, you know, when you made White Girl, it was challenging, I imagine, both creatively, but also industrially, because that's not the kind of film they expected you to make. They want you to make a film set in a hair salon in Brixton. Yeah, <laughs> right. Or, yeah, so, you know, or they want you to make a film about what it's like being black and Muslim in Britain, in Britain yeah. today. <laughs> but, job. And, you know, the irony is that maybe that film is about what it's like being black and, and Muslim in Britain today. It just so happens the character is not you. Or they're a different version of you. So when we decide to make films like that, the industry is not really prepared. Uh, the industry doesn't really want it. They don't really expect it. So the only thing that keeps me going is when I realize, you know, two years, three years into this project, that I think, oh, actually, this project is going to allow me to understand my relationship with my father. That's very compelling for me. Um, but do you think there's a thing about, like, like I recently saw this Mongolian film, I can't remember what it's called, but it was, it was part of Borderline Festival, if that was anyone to look for it. And it was like a story about this like um, gold mining region of Mongolia. Didn't know that was it. Like knew nothing about Mongolia. Do you know what I mean? Um, and like essentially, the political background of the film is about that. It's about the fact that they take you know the land is being bought around from underneath them. They're not using uh, traditional mining methods anymore. They're basically just like fracking the shit out of everything. You know what I mean? It's it's about that. But it's actually about a little kid who loses his mum and decides to um, uh, audition for Mongolia's Got Talent. Wow. Do you know what I mean? And I sort of think that there's an amazing. It's honestly, I, it, it, I've never seen a film that made me instantly want to watch like all of the other films the filmmaker has made. Because yeah. I was like, you know, I love a little like coming of age story as well. I'm like, yeah. you can do it. This is a sports movie. And I sort of feel like, do you ever feel there's a thing where you're like, particularly, I don't make documentary films, so like, I don't know, where you're like, actually, do I make this the bed or do I make this the narrative? Or, you know what I mean? Like, do I run it as the theme mm -hmm. and then do I create a kind of emotional story on top? Do you know what I mean? Like, how yeah. do you decide, like, the kind of opacity that your politics should have on a project? Sorry, I've just taken over your job. No, <laughs> yeah, I agree. You could ask each other questions. I think it's really good. It, it's, uh, do you want to go ahead? No, go ahead. It's, I mean, for me, it's, it's always the subtext, so I don't, my films, it's always weird because I'm very political, I'm very radical in my politics, and I consider my films very radical, but actually, they're very slow, monotonous films where nothing happens, and so people look at them thinking, like, how is this a radically political yeah. film? But uh, it's always subtext, so I find, I like to find the most, almost, in a way, the most benign uh, story and I, I mean story with a sort of capital S in the sense of like, what is the plot of your film? Not much, nothing really happens. But that leaves so much space for all the political mm -hmm. stuff. That's how I like to make films. But also, also boredom is like a hugely underutilized yeah, thing, by the way. They're very, like push through. Exactly. Yeah, no, my films are very boring sometimes. And, and you know, <laughs> politics is very boring, so why not make films? <laughs> But also that it, it just leaves space, it mm -hmm. leaves space. And one of the things that I really dislike about political filmmaking is, is the sort of uh, manifesto as cinema. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, not because I don't agree with it, I and mean, I can watch some great Marxist cinema and think, yes, I agree on all your points. But then I ask myself, why is this a film? Mm -hmm. Instead of a manifesto, for example, a written manifesto, or more often than not, you know, a research project that would fit the medium much better. Or you ask yourself, like we were talking about with, with uh, Debbie Tucker Green, I haven't seen the film, but who is the audience, mm -hmm. right? If it's for fellow Marxists, then um, it can still be a great piece, but it may not be the way I want to communicate in cinema. Uh, so, I, I mean, I wish, I hope that my films 
can both activate people politically uh, and interest people as an audience who, who are watching it. So that's why for me the, the, the politics is always subtextual. But it's also because I went through a period of, of activism and campaigning as, a, as an individual. And I'm, you know, I love it, it's still extremely valuable, but it's not my thing anymore. It's not how, I don't communicate by going out in the street and yelling anymore. I communicate personally much more quietly, patiently, blah, blah, blah. Um, I suppose that you're talking both about craft and like, I think that the films that I started off making sat in such a different place because they were television documentaries, they were made in very small budgets and very small shoots and this question of like urgency, this is you know like a three and a half week shoot, three and a half week edit and that's your film. And there was not a lot of space for nuance mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. silence or metaphor <laughs> or you know a whole load of things that are not part of kind of televisual documentary language. Um, and I also think that really honestly, I was not very concerned with those, with the cinematic values of those films when I was making them. I was, I, you know, now maybe I think about some of those things a bit differently, but at the time I would, I would, you know, I sort of also bought into this idea that I was documenting something and that was a political act and therefore it didn't need to be a piece of, Fellini-esque cinema that I was making. It was a 25-minute low-budget documentary on Al Jazeera. Um, and yeah, I guess I'm like less um, satisfied with those uh, limitations now. And I'm also not sure that they are up to the job um, in, in all circumstances. Um, yeah, I mean, I could I think maybe it's a, you know, a question for you, Said, is around collaboration because you're also a filmmaker. Yeah. And so like in terms of your work, like how does that situate yourself as a filmmaker? Because often filmmakers are seen as like auteurs and there's like in very much like a sort of singular process, but interesting mm. to see if like if that's how your process works or is it a more collaborative process or is it a mixture of that of in between that? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm not very good at collaborating in the sense of uh, co writing or co directing. And I've done, I've done both, and I'm doing the one now as well, but um, yeah, I think, I, and it's not because I'm not good at working with other people, I hope, I, you have to ask them, I don't know, <laughs> but it's, it's because I work very much alone and very slowly and quite, um, quite reclusively, so I'm not always comfortable talking about my work openly as I'm making it, so that's, for me, that's the hardest part about uh, collaborating and I mean that in that sense of co-creating mm. because I like a very long process of reflection and especially with political filmmaking because I, I'm still developing my political perspective and I, it's always developing so as soon as I have an idea personally it takes me months to stew over and think is this right am I, I need to talk to friends and figure out is this the right angle is this the right way of communicating it in a film but when you're co-creating, you immediately have to say, right, this is my idea, and you get immediate feedback or judgment. So it's, that's a really difficult process for me. I much prefer to do that sort of internally over a very long time, because I work slowly. Uh, but definitely the filmmaking process is very uh, collaborative for me, and very much each piece depends on the other. I, I don't like the author theory of the director being in charge of everything. Um, I mean, there's no way that it's true. Even if the director is the origin of the creative ideas, there's no way they can make a film on their own anyway. So it's, it's, it's very inaccurate. But also, uh, for me, you know, it's very important to, to make films in a political way as well as just making films that are about politics. Mm. So if I'm talking about the collective uh, in, in my films, it would be nonsense for me to then take all the credit for a film and say I made this and ignore everyone else. I want the filmmaking process to also reflect the politics, which is this sense of solidarity, a sense of, of collectivity, a sense of also being able to lift up people who don't have those opportunities, being able to work with other people who may not have that work opportunity all the time, so, so that we're reflecting the reality of the film in the process itself. And that, it goes all the way through to the financing, where you take your money from. It goes all the way through to the distribution. What model are you using? Are we still invested in the old 
exclusivity, the capitalist system of exploitation. Uh, so I want to be able to live those values also through the entire life of the film. Partly because I'm still working it out every day, uh, but also because I want the film to have the same sense of integrity as the ideas. But you know, Chloe Zhao can make the Eternals. Sora, <laughs> buy yourself a nice house, Chloe Zhao. Good for you. <laughs> but the, I mean, my biggest concern with that pipeline is actually it's about creativity because, yeah. of course, and I have a, now I have a friend uh, which I find unbelievable, but he's now making a Marvel <laughs> film. But and so I, it's not like I have the conversation where I say, "Why are you guys taking you know Marvel money?" It's more that I think now we're not going to see a small, personal, mm -hmm. quite radical mm -hmm. Chloe Zhao film mm -hmm. for the next 10 years mm -hmm. because she'll do another MCU, she's doing the Star Wars, blah, blah. So it's more that I, it, I just really, um, I'm saddened by the fact that we lose these voices when they go into these yeah. pipelines. For me, it was Mohammed Diab. When I saw Mohammed Diab was doing Moon Knight. That was, was a tough like, one. No! <laughs> <laughs> Unacceptable! Yeah. Uh, but then actually, one. I mean, you know, it's just like fucking hard, isn't it? And and. The thing that sounds, I think I agree with you, it's like those are people to whom the integrity of how they make a film is like so high in the mm -hmm. rest of their oeuvre. And it's like anybody who's ever worked at the studio knows you're like, they're not going to let you have the DOP you want. Like yeah. not even the DOP is the person. You know, I, remember yeah. I did a conversation for BAFTA with Remy Weeks when he made his house. Um, and he was really honest and I actually really admired him for being that honest. But, you know, his film went from being, like, in his head, an £150,000 film to a $15 million film because, I think it was New Regency, came on board. And, and I was like, did the film change? He was like, no, except for I didn't get to work with anybody I wanted. Mm -hmm. Because suddenly I went from being the voice, the, you know, the, the absolute, you know. And it was a project he'd taken on. It was an existing script that he'd then rewritten. And, you know, and suddenly I became the wild card. Like, I lost all status with the production of exactly the same film. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I have regrets about that. I think the film, you know what I mean? And I was like, yeah, I mean, you didn't get that this is being put out. <laughs> and he was mm -hmm. like, yeah, those people are amazing, but they are not the people I wanted to work with. I wanted to work with the people that I've been doing DIY films with for 10 years. So I just think, I think you're right. I think it's, it's the sacrifice of the process that's really sad. Products are like, you know, does it matter if Closure, Director of the Eternals, no, it's probably the same film. Right, right. <laughs> with, more, with more sunsets or whatever the fuck it was that Ken P could never see. Him. He was like, oh my god, is that CGI? She's like, no, that's the sun. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, sorry, did you want to? I don't know. Or maybe, um, yeah. I was just thinking about the, um, just in the documentary world, this question of where, who you get to work with, but in the documentary world, when you go to a big production house, and I know because this happened on the film that I'm making, that if you go to a big production house, they will also take you off as a director. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can go with a great idea that you've developed and you believe that you want to make the way you want to make it, but you can not guarantee that they will not throw you off and put a big name director on it mm -hmm. unless you do that. So there are, it's much harder as an independent filmmaker with a particular kind of political vision or set of values that you want to work with to even get to the point where your film is made, because mm. by you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a really important point that you make, because I think, I, I had no idea that that happened to filmmakers, that they're basically throwing up their projects if they, it's like, it's that thing of like, it's a deal with the devil, where it's like, you go to them because they have the resources, because mm -hmm. I'm also a producer, but like, I do it on the other end, I'm a podcast producer, and there's always kind of these conversations of like backroom deals and like how do you how do you determine rights and IP and there are all these kind of different negotiations happening and who knows like who's the author of a particular thing like you know there's always these kind of conversations being had but it's like when the money comes into it that's kind of when things change a bit and as filmmakers particularly trying to get stuff because you're you know you mentioned that it's really hard to get things fun in the first place but how do you um, sort of like keep your voice when you're producing work like in terms of like the the whole like circus of fundraising and, and, and trying to get money to get your film made because you know you can have all the will in the world but it's like it takes financing to be able to if you're going to a particular location like to be able to go to those locations to like build up you know your your contacts and, and you know getting um voices on the ground like how do you then negotiate and support them you're mentioning how it takes you a very long time to often make your projects i'm just wondering how much finance is in in that but kind of um Maybe to kind of direct to the, to the to the documentary makers, it's like, 
um, how do you make sure, how do you get your films made first and foremost? Um, uh, and the second part to that is like, how do you keep your voice when you're making those projects? Um, and I'm going to go first to Anna. I mean, that, that, that <laughs> I've been trying to make a film for five years mm. because I don't want anybody else to make it because I don't believe that the British film or any film industry at the level at which the big production companies operate under, will understand it or be able to get it through without ruining it, mm -hmm. without missing the fundamental points of it. But, you know, that's <laughs> this thing about who tells the story, who, how important it is who tells the story, who that person is and what their particular experiences and visions bring to that process. Um, obviously, the film industry is mostly white. I mean, it's not like a news. Wait, flash. what? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Shut the front door. Um, so you know, there are there are loads of questions that there are loads of reasons that. Um, but it's very very hard to make films independently, because you have to, you know, I mean, basically you have to just fund it bit by bit. The film industry is obviously for that reason dominated by people of a certain level of privilege because not many people can afford to live and work from film. I guess most of us do or have at some points done other jobs. Very, I, certainly, I mean, you know, I live as a translator and a journalist um, to make films. Um, and, I, and I come from privilege, so, you know, I'm, it is an extremely hard industry to operate in. Sorry for calling it an industry. Um, anyway. I'm no, is it not <laughs> an industry? Why, what, yeah. why did you call oh, it? Oh, it's also craft. Oh, I see, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I get you. Um, well, it, it kind of comes down to this te the team that you know we were talking about, whether it's an individual effort. I think uh, it, it would be impossible to make films on my own. So there's, there's a huge amount of love and respect and admiration for the team that works with the films I'm making, you know. Um, producer in particular, who's... We get along very well and we work together for a very long time, but we, we're, we, you know, we have this relationship where uh, we both, we're both on the same page about the sort of film that we're trying to make and about also the politics in the filmmaking process. And she's very good at convincing people to, to support that kind of project. Um, but it's really, I mean, it also helps that, that this is not British, the British money. So my, my films generally are not funded in this country um, and generally are not very popular in this country as well because it's, a, it's just a style of filmmaking that doesn't fit into the industry mold at this point. Uh, but something I've always... You know, one of the reasons why I say my films are kind of boring and they don't have much of a plot, uh, it's not only because I love that kind of cinema, but it's also a defense mechanism in a way, because it, it, you know, I think it's impossible for other people to make my films. And I don't mean that uh, to brag about my talent or anything, <clears throat> but there's almost nothing there to steal. You know, and I've found over the years that the more and more obscure the fundamental heart of my film, the harder it is for someone else to say, like, oh, you know what, Palestinian football team, I kind of like that idea, maybe I'm going to do it. So, so I, I really move away from any of those films that have uh, a plot that's sexy, that someone else can go like, hey, I like that, it's got a beginning, middle, and an end, there's a winner and a loser, what if I make that film? And then I have to worry, I'm like, oh, is someone going to make a better version of this because they have more money or whatever? It's totally the opposite. I mean, nobody is going to sit in the corner of someone's house in Burma for five years staring at a family doing nothing and making the film that I made. There's no way. There's no way anyone's going to make it. And even if they wanted to, they couldn't because there's no plot, there's no hook to steal. So I developed this way of working that I just, my films are almost impossible to explain, but it's kind of like you get it when you see it. But also, I think it's, it's really difficult because the industry is more obsessed than it has ever been. And I do mean the industry, I don't mean the craft, do you know what I mean? Because I don't think artists are more obsessed with this, with IP. It's, it's never been as yeah. obsessed as it is. And I say this like the feature film I'm shooting in the spring is an adaptation of a very famous novel. And when, and when you see um, suddenly the amount of money that comes into play when you're talking about recognisable IP, 
and you're like, motherfucker, I've never made a feature film. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know what I'm doing, but suddenly it's like, everyone's talking about it. Do you know what I mean? Because, and, and you're like, this is really scary because, I don't know, I, I find it weird. It's a, it's a modern novel, it's, it's not a kind of classic novel or anything, but mm-hmm. I'm like, it, it just weirds me out because I'm like, this was an original story at some point and it's already kind of gathered its, like, rolling stone, do you know what I mean? And so I, I sort of find the whole thing of, um, like, whenever I do an adaptation, of anything on stage or on screen, I'm like, the thing I'm always trying to recreate is the experience that the first ever audience of that thing had. Do you know what I mean? Or so it's just like, what did this feel like? It can be anything, dude. It can be Dickens, and you, you should still try and do this as far as I'm concerned, where it's like, what was, the, and how do I recreate that emotional or physiological experience for an, for an audience today? And I think that whole thing of like, you know, now the second that something is published, it become you know like bad art friend. There was a bidding war within five hours, mm-hmm. and MGM won. I know because I was asked to do one of them, and I was like, whatever that. Oh, it's over. <laughs> it's gone to MGM. Um, and you're like that to me is really like very strange, and and actually the the kind of kind of money pressure that puts on the story is really fucking weird. Do you know what I mean? And I think particularly things that are like the whole cat person mm. thing and now that's a film with, you know, cousin Greg from Succession. Um and it, it like that whole um but that's what the industry wants and, and actually, you know, I have really felt even in my short years of making films, like, you know, I can feel all my like original story films doing this. <laughs> and all the IP films are doing this. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that makes you really sad because I wanted to make that film maybe even more than I... Do you know what I mean? But, like, yeah, it's just shit, isn't it? But I, think, I do think... I think it is fascinating, though, because, like, um, so this American movie I'm making, and Americans are hilarious, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, is about the kind of... the danger of African-Americans trying to construct going-home narratives with Africa. Um, and it's really funny because when you do it, you're doing your due diligence with financiers, you have to be like, so is there any chance that this money is committed to slavery? <laughs> Just, I, know, I know you said that your grandfather grew tobacco, <laughs> but chances are, <laughs> you know, and then they go, no, no, it's tech money. I'm like, okay, so cool. So, no, no, wait. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's their own, like, it takes months of just being like, I can't make a film that's literally about the legacy of colonialism and then be like, yeah, but it turns out that all the cash. And and I sort of feel like we can get a bit like lured in this country into like, it's the BFI, it's fine, it's from the lottery. And I'm like, cool, we still like advertise gambling totally, like, mm-hmm. you know, targetedly in certain areas. But do you know what I mean? Like I just feel and then you end up in a whole like is all money dirty, like what the fuck? Do you know what I mean? Like I, I don't I don't know how helpful that whole thing is, but I do think it's important that you at least have a conversation with yourself about like what things are you willing to compromise on. Yeah. Yeah. There's the, yeah. I mean, in, in in documentary, especially, you're talking about this obsession with IP, and we're we're in a sort of uh, the period we're now is almost like a double-edged sword. That so many documentaries are being made, mm-hmm. and documentary is very popular on on streaming platforms. So uh, I love how people, you didn't say Netflix. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean all of them, and I hate the word streamers because it sounds like a party thing, so I don't use that term. Um, and so from the outside, people think, oh great, the documentary industry is so healthy, you must be so excited, <clears throat> and it's called the golden age of documentary, which I completely disagree with. But uh, I think so, uh, Simon Kilmurray, you know, who was mm. used to be at the screen, I know, the Irish Screen Board, I think, but then went to the IDA. And he had a talk online about a month ago where he said it's not the golden age of documentary, it's just the height of industrial production of documentary, so it looks like a golden age. And the fact is, like you said, that the interest in documentary as an industry is huge, uh, especially because it has a very low cost of production but can make a much higher profit margin, so industrially it, it, it's, a go- it's the goose that laid the golden egg. But uh, creatively, the interest in different voices, like you're saying, or different ways of seeing the world, ha- has been minimized, especially because now they're at a point where they are trying to make the machine as efficient as possible. Which means the interest in, in a political angle, or the interest in a radical way of telling stories, is minimized. It's, it's, they're, they're terrified, mm-hmm. because then suddenly you jeopardize the, the project, you jeopardize the product. 
so we're, we're in a very strange time where there is a lot of money, but it's not really making the kinds of things that we're interested in making. I would definitely agree with you. I think it's. I think when money comes into, I, I as I mentioned before, like I'm in the podcast industry, and like um, a couple of years, about two or three years ago, um, Spotify bought a production company for like, I think it was like um, five hundred million dollars, mm -hmm. and that's like unprecedented. And suddenly everyone thought it's going to be the golden age of podcasting, and lots of things have been made. But then it kind of, and again, like podcasting, but like documentary making, it's like, like it's. Generally, it's, it's populated by people who are really passionate about a particular subject matter. Most people who make podcasts or that become very successful are either from really big production companies or they're people like Joe Rogan who just like churn out mm -hmm. loads of episodes again and again and again. And it's like, yes, there's money, but where does that money go to? Is it going to documentaries? There is money, but it'll be like going towards documentaries like there was like a Lululemon documentary that I saw recently that was really, really big. I think it's called, not Lululemon, no, Lula Rose. Lula Rose is different from Lululemon. Lula Rose is basically <laughs> Like a pyramid leggings company. Mm, like Fabletics. Yeah, yeah. Fabletics. Like Fabletics. And so it will go to things like that. It will go to things like, um, you know, Tiger King. It will go to things that are very like salacious. They're not gonna. It's not gonna be a documentary about a child living in Mongolia. It's not gonna go towards that. Like that's not the. the <laughs> It will, it will be something that's kind of sexy or true crime. Again, like with podcasting and probably same with documentary making is that you'll find endless true crime um, podcasts and then they'll get adapted into documentaries. And then from those documentaries, the IP will be then sold off to making a film. And it's like this kind of thing where everyone is, the people who are really in charge of that, those kind of creative endeavours are people who are not interested in creativity, but who are like, what will make us the most amount of money? What's the mm -hmm. cheapest and easiest to produce? And what will make the most amount of money? And this is kind of kind of spinning off from that, and I'm going to ask all of you this: it's like, how do you resist that pressure in your work to sort of like appeal to that? And like, it, as like creative people, like, what are the compromises and what are the things? Well, even the compromises, what are the things you're like really sticking to your guns about in terms of um, the filmmaking process? They are like, okay, they're asking me to go in this direction. I can see where they're going, but actually, I'm going to stick to my guns and move in this direction. And where you're like, you know what? This is I can. This is not the hill I want to die on. I can make this particular compromise and change. Although it's kind of like an expansive question, like answering it whichever way you know you feel comfortable. Um, can I just say that when Tiger King turned up at the beginning of the pandemic, I was like, just wipe us all out. Like we don't, <laughs> we don't deserve this planet we have. Do you know what I mean? Just like everyone, oh my God, and you're just like just kill everyone. Um, what am I willing to compromise on? Do you know what? It's really interesting because, and this is not me um, bragging, I promise you it isn't, but just because I think it is an interesting case study. Like, my film that I'm shooting next year is a £10 million film, and that is not how I expected to make a feature film, but that's what comes with making a film that's like based on some famous IP. And, um, and so that real question of like, what am I not willing to compromise on? And I knew the thing that I would never get was director's cut. I was like, there is no way they're going to give me director's cut on this. But I love my producers. My producers are all black women. There's one white woman who snuck in. But do you know what I mean? Like, this isn't them coming from a bad thing, but the whole thing of there's an obsession in this industry with the you film, you know, the love of somebody making their first feature. And I was like, so what power do I have to negotiate? You know, even though these are people I love, these are producers I love, they've done nothing but support my vision for this film. And it was a film that had been through many directors and many kind of iterations, you know what I mean? And, and I came up with a version of it that stuck and wrote it. So already you have power, because you're like, I've written that script. <laughs> like, so already you're gonna, if you want to pull me out of it, that script comes with me. Um, and actually for me, it was about people. So I get, I get final say on who all my HMDs are, because I'm like, I know that I can't make, I don't do well being in a minority <laughs> at work. Like, I know that about myself, it makes me edgy as shit. Um, and so actually I was like, if I could control who is making the film with me and contractually be obligated to that, that will determine the film more than us arguing about three seconds on this cut and three seconds on that cut. And, and also I think in that, um, and it was a real um, progression in my own life. I used to believe that I was not a writer, that I was a director, my job was working with actors. I love working with actors. It's maybe my favourite part of the job. Um, and that I facilitated writers. Um, and then, in fact, when me and Omar were at Sundance um, at the lab together, which was amazing, um, had to write a scene for the first time ever, beginning of 2020. Um, 
and I wrote it, and I got picked out as the best one. I was like, oh, <laughs> and, and then I didn't stop writing. I've written like four feature films and two TV series in the last 18 months. And actually, to, I, do, I think you're right. I think, I think that it is not one person makes a film, but actually I realised that there was so much like, more clarity that came with being the writer and the, and the director and actually being like, you know, and, and I'm very lucky because when I work with people like Omar or with uh, the writer Somalia Seaton, who I work with a, a lot, they get that. So everything is knitted into it from a scriptural point. Um, and that's what financiers are seeing, and that's what HODs are seeing, and that's what actors are seeing. So you're like, actually, if I've got, if, if who I am is in that script from day one, then that's what you're getting on board with, do you know what I mean? Like, you understand the kind of, um, you know, and, and I think it also avoids all those moments where you're like, what, I'm naked in this scene? And you're like, oh, was it not in the script? That has never happened to me because I'm just an asshole. But it does genuinely happen. Like, I have actress friends mm -hmm. who are like, and then I had to take all my clothes off, and I'm like, it wasn't in the script when you got it? And she's like, no. And I was like, ah, oh, Game of Thrones. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and so I sort of think, to me, it's about people, not product, anyway. It's also not about stuff. Um, I think a little bit like Remy Weeks, I think in your head the £150,000 version and the $15 million version are the same film. It's just the people who have changed in his experience, maybe not the way he wanted it to. So for me it was like, as long as I'm taking people with me who are, you know, and it's the editor who edited both of my short films. Do you know some of them are people who have come up with me and they're now in their own successes and I'm like, great, let's all go make a weird American film together. Um, that's that's fine. The sort of, I mean, I had such an awful experience making my short, my first short, um, in that whole um, that edit period. Like the making of it was amazing. I edited it for ten months, um, not by choice, um, and had such an awful experience that I was like, it's it's just got to be about the people. I needed to be more vigilant. That's what I learned on that film was to be much more um, have put people under a lot more kind of scrutiny as to like who are you what are your beliefs what are your values um because and also like people are good at different bits of the process mm -hmm. like you might be have a producer and be like oh my god but you put this whole film together so well but then actually if you know also never work with anyone that you secretly think is an idiot during just because you can wrap them around your little finger no but this is the thing you know like where some people are like oh but you know i'm the more important creative so it kind of doesn't matter that he's like a bit dumb i'm like it really does fucking matter because at some point that is going to come back and bite you in the ass and i actually feel like you know i just uh, you know and, and this is another thing about being part of institutions you know i really just got picked up by the bfi and they were like you should make films and i was like okay uh and uh, so i didn't i didn't you know maybe i didn't have the kind of rigor that i had in my other practice about like who are you what do you believe in you know what kind of films do you love like what you know how do you like to work with people because i didn't know anything and i think knowing your own power and that the idea comes from within you and cannot come from anyone else you have to like wield that fucking power and not apologize for it and just be like, you know. I remember there was a day that the BFI were like, you know, and I was, my editor is a young black man called Endemir. And they were like, we don't love this edit. We just, it's not, it's not the film we thought was, you know, gonna be the film. We're gonna send in this other editor to like come in and look at your film and there's like old white dude up here. And me and Endemir were just like, nope. <laughs> like, and I'd said to them, the most important person for me being a black person is specifically the editor. Like, if my editor is not black, I cannot make this film just because there was shit I didn't want to have to explain. Um, and so the fact that they, like, it wasn't like they sent in all black dude. <laughs> they were like, no, we're going to send in, like, what we believe to be um, excellent. Do you know what I mean? Like, look, and he hadn't even, like, ever edited, like, a horror film. It wasn't even like it made any kind of sense to the... It made more sense if they sent in a white woman. Do you know what I mean? I would have been like, okay, I get it. Maybe it's about the protecting or whatever. And I just was like, yeah, this is the problem, is that you actually don't believe in people. You're just interested in product. Mm. And mm. to me, if the film is flawed, it should be flawed on its own terms and by the people who made it. Um, so yeah, it's people. Please. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I have to say that having chosen a difficult path to making a film independently, I, it has it does have its own rewards, um, huge rewards, creatively, intellectually. Um, to work on one thing, I'll say to question, is it worth it? Uh, mm. Why am I doing this? And why, I mean, my family are just like, 
when are we going to see this film? <laughs> are you sure you shouldn't just get a job? Um, it's, it's, it's very rewarding to work, to find those people who, who share a vision with you. Um, and it does, I believe it is worth it in terms of the work, I believe that the work that you see churned out on streaming platforms is evidently not of the same quality of work that is made with integrity that requires, mm. unless you are extremely lucky, some sacrifice along the way. Um, I don't believe in making that many compromises, mm. frankly, mm. in like, work, as, as few as you can get away with, without being an asshole. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what's the point? <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure I understand. I mean, I, I understand why people take the true crime game mm. when they've made, you know, I have a friend who made an independent film, it took him seven years to make, and then he took a true crime series. I mean, fair enough. Um, we've all got to eat. Mm. But, um, but yeah, I think if you actually believe in it, then it's worth it, I hope. It's more, I think it's a little more complicated with documentary, mm. only because you're usually, you're dealing with real people's lives. So, so, and uh, for me, at least, as a documentary filmmaker, the, the only thing you have is your integrity. You know, you're, you're never... I also make fiction now, so it's a slightly different uh, conversation, but you're never going to be a famous documentary filmmaker with a career that people recognize in the streets. I mean, it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have the same uh, profile as, as other forms of creating entertainment. Uh, so really all you have is your integrity in the way that you work with, with your team, of course, but more importantly, the way you work with the people you're filming with. And if they don't trust you, <clears throat> or they think that the, the product is corrupt for one reason or another, ethically, uh, then you have nothing. And I can't, you know, I can't live with myself knowing that I made a film that mistreated someone or exploited someone. And my concern when, when money comes into the equation is what is it that we're willing to sacrifice for that money, you know? And if it's a creative issue, of course it's something I'm willing to argue with if I think it's important. But it's much more important for me to maintain those ethical considerations if somebody says, let's make the film this way because it's easier. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's probably easier for a reason. It's easier because the system's been designed to efficiently exploit people, therefore we can do it. Uh, those are the things that I would really stand up for and risk the film for and risk my career for, uh, is when we're preserving the integrity of the project and, and, you know, if you make films in a war zone or with the vulnerable people, you're talking about people's lives who are at risk, it's not a joke. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we turn those films into products, then it really is a joke. You know, nobody cares yeah. about those people's lives. There's a Britney Spears thing that I found <laughs> fascinating. Um, you know, there were, f I think, four really big Britney Spears docs. And I was reading this, this, doc, uh, this interview with one of the directors who was a, she called herself a Britney Spears, Britney Spears super fan. And, um, I mean, the cognitive dissonance was incredible. She was saying, Britney Spears feels like she's been totally manipulated by the media and really suffers from media scrutiny over the years. And I reached out to her and she said, I don't want to be involved in this documentary because I don't want to relive this trauma. Uh, while she's promoting her enormous, you know, multi-million dollar budget documentary about the trauma that Britney Spears experienced through media scrutiny. And it just made absolutely no sense to me, no matter how big a Britney Spears super fan I was. And, and that's what really breaks my heart about the way money is used in the industry, is that it's, it's buying people's integrity, in that sense. And we, I think we kid ourselves if we imagine that there are no consequences to what we create. Because uh, it's a huge industry with an immense amount of, um, of influence over how people see the world and how policy is enacted, etc., etc. So we have to be aware of that. Can I ask you both a question? Which is, so um, the film that me and 
Am I working on is a film about a documentary maker? <laughs> wow. Um, and the ethics of documentary making. So I don't want to make documentaries, but I do want to make films about you guys. Um, and Wait, is this is part of the documentary. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you insisted on the camera, and that's about to bite you in the ass. Um, but one of the things, that, just to give you a little crazy, is that the plot is about a woman who has just made her first feature documentary, and it was hugely successful. And it's about the death of her grandmother that she, you know, she was with her grandmother during her age. And it's, the, you know, so our film is sort of asking, like, what the fuck do you do after that? So I was just wondering, like, do you ever think about what your next film is? Do you, do you ever realise yourself to be like, and once I have made this magnum opus, yeah. I will make a Britney Spears story. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure that I'll make another film. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's like, sometimes that's what I think. Like, I don't know whether, um, I mean, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a difficult question. It's a hard thing to keep going at. Like, the older you get, the less easy it is to make um, these kinds of decisions. Where, uh, yeah, so I actually don't know if if there is even another film that I would follow this film up with. Because um, you don't want to make another one, or you don't think you can. I just think it takes so much, mm. um, and I love film, but I'm not sure that I love anything that much. That. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know, there are other things, there are other things that are more important, I think, as well, in the world. Um, and it's, sometimes it feels like an indulgence, mm -hmm. to be really honest. Um, I'm not sure that I'm okay with that. But, mm -hmm. you know, there are other films, there are other ideas. I would love to make a film about Tim Westwood. Yes, yes, I would watch this film. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, you know, that would, that I was just once, be like, I was once at a um, nightclub and Tim Westwood had just finished a set when I turned up and I was like, no, oh, I need to leave. Uh, and he was like <laughs> handing out flyers to only the fit girls and then he handed one to me and I genuinely was like, oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> Made it! Um, it's like reappraising you know, the era that you grew up in. Yeah. <laughs> like all these things that you just like normalised and then you're like, what? <laughs> what was like that? The son of a vicar who <laughs> then decides to like embed himself in like black space and black culture. And he's like, yeah, I've been shot like nine times at 50 cents. And yet we Whatever. love that shit. <laughs> yeah, it needs to exist. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think you've kind of like pretty much like, I, actually, I want to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. like, what are you excited about next? Like, in terms of your work? Yeah, do you know what? Um, I'm, I'm the opposite. I've got like 12 things on the go at any one time because um, too much of the process of... For, and it's why I like keeping doing theatre. So like I'm doing a show in the West End in the spring because it's like a very fixed point. It's like, mm. it will start rehearsals on this day. It will press on it. And you're like, yes, brilliant. Can't shift. They've already sold tickets. Um, uh, and and so that keeps me sane, but actually I just found like, because all of my early work was obviously self-started, I was very used to working at my own pace, do you know what I mean? It's like, I'm going to make this thing happen, I'm going to make this thing happen, and I wasn't, re you know, I wasn't reliant on arts funding. That was a big decision I took, because I was like, I can't fill in these fucking forms, so I'm just going to have to find money through non-kind of arts council, whatever, whatever. Um, and I did. Uh, and um, and so it, it's the pace of filmmaking does not suit my personality mm -hmm. in terms of I have to be doing something every day, and so actually for me like oh if you saw my diary it's a beautiful color coded thing like every minute of every day is accounted for it's like this and this morning oh I'm God. writing a draft of this I can't handle like, it, no. yeah yeah but that's you know and it's and it's totally like a like a personality thing you know what I mean I don't I don't necessarily enjoy it I would much rather just be focusing on one film etc etc. But I used to like genuinely like cry myself to sleep at night and pull out my hair because this thing that I really wanted to make was just being held up in the process of making. And in a way I was like, you have a choice to make between your own happiness and like your insanity. Do you know what I mean? Kind of like this and, and just to make me feel more sane. I just felt like I had, and for it to not feel like an indulgence, I was like, I had to feel like I was working constantly. Um, now I'm a bit more like taking off doing off. But, um, Yes, I'm excited about. I'm excited about loads of things. I'm excited about loads of things. You know, I don't. I'm actually excited most about um, collective things. Like I just had my first experience of being um, part of a group of makers, um, and I was like the little like film newbie. Oh, they've only got two shorts. This is the second one, um, and actually, I feel like what I really realised, and and actually all of us realised, I'm the only girl. That's not great, but you know, I'll take what I can. Um, you know, we're all black, and um, and actually, I feel like 
Um, you know, I, I really do. I'm, I'm quite sentimental and I look back at things like, you know, the LA Film Rebellion and the Black Audio Collective and I am like so deeply jealous. Like I'm like properly jealous in my heart and I think it's why I collaborate with the same people I've collaborated with over nearly 10 years, my friend Somali, my friend Brad, like we've all collaborated for a very long time because I think I do want that. Like working at home has not been good for me because I like to go to, like I used to love like, renting a desk space, <laughs> like go to a place every day. Um, but you know, working on these films with, you know, four of the directors I admire hugely, and actually it wasn't, it's not like some like deeply profound thing most of the time, sometimes it's just like, Guys, so I'm thinking about this thing, and everyone's like, it's dumb. And you're like, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> this is everything I've ever wanted. Um, and actually, we realised, kind of as a group, that it was like, we've been forced apart because this industry thrives on the idea of the individual. It, mm -hmm. it purposely keeps us apart. It keeps us in competition with each other. But actually, you know, and, and I think the reason that we work together as a group of directors is that we're all, like, from the outside at the same level of success. Do you know what I mean? So actually they're like, oh, you can be a group because you've all like graduated through, like you've all had films of competition, such and such one Sundance. You know what I mean? So they're like, oh, you've sort of evolved beyond the fight. And they're like, if you knew how much we fight every fucking day just to survive. <laughs> um, so I sort of feel like I'm increasingly interested in um, just ways of being, um, not just collaborating, but being collective, actually. And, and, and actually we talk about it a lot because a lot of them talk about various kind of collective moments they've tried to be in that have failed and it and it fails because of this competition that is implicit within the industry but I'm like I, and so the fuck thing I find myself questioning when I'm not like writing 12 scripts is like how can I find ways to be collective and I don't necessarily it's just it was, it was from meeting Fonza Woods this um this summer when I was in France I drove down to go and interview her in her house and which was amazing and she was like, and she was an East Coast director. She's from Detroit, but was in New York. And she was like, yeah, man, I never, you know, I never met Bill Gowan. I never met Kathleen Collins. Like, I met Spike Lee once. You know, and she was like, we, you know, I kind of looked at the LA Rebellion. I was like, man, I wish I'd had that. And I think about all those filmmakers that have been strengthened by collective, and I think about all the filmmakers that we have probably lost because they have not had enough of a collective around them to support them because the kind of evils of competition enter relationships here yeah, and, and it's disingenuous to pretend they don't and um, so yeah I think I'm just thinking more about like how I can be um like a support to those around me but also ask for help mm -hmm. like being better at like not knowing shit and being okay with asking I don't know anything I've made two fucking short films like what the fuck do I know and then people assume they both if you're a debut feature filmmaker they both want you to have the kind of naivete of being a virgin do you know what I mean it's like oh we have found this talent and we must elevate her to the world but they also kind of expect you to know everything mm. it's like they also expect to walk onto the set and just like know how to you know behave with everyone and that can be like psychologically a bit weird because you sort of feel like you can't ask any questions because you don't want to risk your power but then you genuinely like don't have the answer to something so I think I'm just trying to get better at that I feel there are a lot of filmmakers around me who also they're sick of pretending that they're basically made out of Teflon mm -hmm. and I think that's really good Thank you, I'm going to ask that to both of you like what are you excited about and then after that I'm going to open it up to the audience uh, to ask questions uh, I mean, it's, it's weird, I don't, I still have the same passion and love and total obsession for cinema that I had when I was, when I was young. So it's very hard, I mean, I, you know, more or less I don't have much else in my life other, other than filmmaking. Uh, so, and in a funny way, the older I get, I, I, I'm a little more comfortable with myself and knowing myself, of course, but also knowing the kinds of films that I want to make. I would say, in a way, the, the last documentary that I finished now, it's the, really the first time that I made something and I thought, this, is re this reflects the kind of film I wanted to make. You know, and that took <clears throat> almost 20 years of filmmaking. So, uh, so I'm at a point where I do think I can see how to repeat this process, how, how and why I would continue. Uh, but it's also <clears throat> so much of the what keeps me going is just is my teaching. It's it's working with younger filmmakers and seeing that they have the same passion for cinema that I do. 
and that I did when I was young, you know, and knowing that there are people whose lives, like mine, were saved by film. You know, my life really was saved by cinema. Um, and, I, and I believe in it in a, in a very emotional way in the sense that it tells me so much about myself and it tells me so much about the world. So I can assume that if it means that much to me, it means that much to other people. And I, I, I always have this struggle as well, like you're saying about... Uh, can we justify it? Because, you know, it can be a very indulgent industry, it can be a very expensive industry, it can be a very exploitative industry. Um, but I also think it's easy to look at it superficially as, let's say, a form of entertainment. But it's also, there, there's a writer, sadly died, but Jack Shaheen, who wrote a lot about how Arabs are portrayed in the media, and he calls cinema uh, our visual heritage. So if we think of it that way, that it's, it's, it's part of how we define ourselves, how we define our communities, how we define our history, then I think we can frame it in a way that it's very significant. Um, and when I see people who were, you know, who are the age that I was when I fell in love with cinema saying to me, when I, you know, we run a workshop and they say, I've never been in a room with other Arab filmmakers. This is revolutionary for me, you know. And I think that's why it's important to me. If it, if it just helps that guy to come to terms with his identity, then it's important for me. That's also why I get so upset about uh, losing our integrity when money comes in, because I think those people who create the industrial cinema and, and, and purely commercial cinema don't necessarily understand what it means to other people. You know, they don't necessarily understand the power it can have in helping us to identify who we are and how we want to interact with the world. And uh, also giving us a way of communicating, because it, it, it is, a, it is a, a, a thesis in a way, it's a treatise, it's a way of me saying, well, we may not be able to understand each other sitting next to each other, but here's something I prepared earlier. <laughs> you know, now you'll know how I see the world. And I, it's, it's always a kind of a jokey thing with my, with my dad, but... Um, he watches a film that I've made, and we always have this moment. I don't, it's, it can be difficult to communicate with him, but we have this moment of communication after we watch a film. And they've been some of the most profound moments of my life, when he finally understands something about me, and I've finally understood something about him. Um, it's very valuable. I can never imagine giving that up. It's all good. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to hand the mic to Arwa, um, and she will then um, pass it around the audience um, for questions. Um, I had a question earlier because I was at the screening. And um, I, I guess this is a question for all of you guys. Um, you guys have been talking a lot about like the industry and money and stuff. My question is more towards like craft mm -hmm. and method and language. Um, how do you guys navigate that? Because um, me personally, um, I representation I think is the bane of our people. I think if we continue to want it, it's going to cause more problems. It causes problems anyways. Um, but I think even down to filmmaking, um, it isn't just about like who's behind the camera and who's got the camera and who wrote it, but it's about how it's being told because we have to think about like the history of cinema the history of Hollywood, the language that is being used, how we, when we put a camera here, what does that mean? When we transition from this to this, what does that mean? And how we edit it, it's also racialized, you know? So it's kind of like, for me, as somebody who's, uh, I'm not a cinephile, but I like the process of it, and I like the idea of language, because talk about communication. Um, how do you ensure that your identity or your vision isn't, um, for lack of a better word, uh, colonialized because of the language and the method that you were using to actually tell the story and where I mean. Method, I mean your shots, your camera placement, your lenses, your lighting, your, um, and then when you go into your edit, your transitions, your, how you cut from one place to another, like where are you getting that language from? Because I, as a black woman, I see a lot of black films. Half of the majority of those films are not necessarily black films just because black people made them. Do you know what I mean? It is down to the language because that's what we communicate, that's what we kind of like um, 
enjoy it or kind of um, resonate with it isn't necessarily just about the dialogue or just about this is the way it's being done that kind of hits me. So I just wonder on a language level, on a craft level, where do you get your information from about how you are telling your stories? You don't, if you don't, sure, if you don't want to. Uh, it's a really good question. Right? I'm really now, I'm deeply invested in, in decolonizing cinema in the process. Um, and it's a, it's a multi-step process. The first part, the most important part, it's almost like you know, trying to kick an addiction. The, the most important part is to admit that we're, we're all within a, a colonized system of storytelling. Um, then we have to deconstruct it, then we have to reconstruct our own, uh, put it very simply. I, I can talk, I mean, I, I'm going to talk about Arab cinema in particular, but I think this applies to a lot of different kinds of cinema. That I think now we're at a stage in Arab cinema where we have merely replaced foreign characters with Arab characters. Mm -hmm. And it's arguable whether that's really an Arab cinema, because we're reproducing the old models, telling the old stories, but there are different people in the acting roles. And, and that's not enough for me. Uh, it's not necessarily good cinema, but it's also very destructive because we recreate these, uh, these processes without knowing why. Uh, so it's, it's a real process of, I, I like to think of it like archaeology, because we're digging, we have to dig through these many layers. But what we find at the end is not an answer, it's a tiny piece of something. For me, for example, it's about folklore now. I've been, I've been digging very deeply into Arab folklore. And every once in a while, I find a beautiful piece of story that reminds me of my childhood, reminds me of an incident that I saw. It fits in with a scene that I wrote. And suddenly, it becomes a new vocabulary. And what, what I really dream of is creating a vernacular that's that's uh, really distinctly, let's say, Palestinian cinema vernacular. Or maybe it's even just personally that people will look at it and say, yes, I recognize that as a film by sight. But it's that, it, it's, the same, it's the same when we meet someone and we talk. I, you know, I always, I'm always very wary when I watch, uh, let's say, a Q&A, <clears throat> when a director's personality doesn't reflect their film mm -hmm. for me. I, go, I always get very suspicious because I think, where, is this authentic? Mm. You know, has somebody chosen a means of communicating through film that's different from their real personality because they thought it was more commercial or they thought it was more popular or they thought it was more successful? So, you know, for me, I'm, I, I'm always thinking about how I express myself in conversation. And I always want to choose my words wisely and I, maybe sometimes I talk quite slow and sometimes I stumble over my words, etc., etc. But I want my films to also look like that. And so that vocabulary contains, for me, my life history, but also my parents, and the way of communicating that I adopted from them, and the hundreds of years of history behind their lives that informed that. So it's a very slow process, but the hardest part is to escape that orbit of ideology and understand that we are still creating colonized stories without knowing it if all we do is replace the name or ethnicity of the character. And unfortunately, the industry is also at a point where that's their version of success. It's representational. It's, it's representational, and, it, and it's really meaningless unless you change the, the, the sub-layers. Because also what it ends up doing is co-opting us. So there are many Arab filmmakers that maybe years ago I admired and now I realize they're just reproducing the system because they've, they've been co-opted. That's not enough for me. If I, feel, if I think of myself as a radical filmmaker, I need to make films in a radical way. I think also you can just like, I don't know, I've worked with a lot of actors um, and that's the advantage of having been a theatre director is I, I've worked with more actors than most film directors have had options. <coughs> Um, and and to me, and I guess this relates to the thing that I was saying earlier about like texts in many ways being the last thing I resort to, um, is it's about connecting with performance. It's just about like, and it, and it governs everything, it governs shot choice, you know, it, it's everything. It's about how do I um, connect an audience to this actor's performance and how do I get the performance of a fucking lifetime out of this actor. Um, and 
to me, I think that's partly because English is not my first language. Uh, and, uh, and so I want to create things that no matter what language you speak, you can connect to the emotional moment. Um, don't get me wrong, there's loads of like amazing, like super dialogue heavy um, writers, of course there are, do you know what I mean? And like part of the, maybe it's just me like obscuring the fact that I don't write dialogue that well. But I sort of think it's like, you just have to do everything that you can do to connect an audience to the story through the protagonist or protagonists. You know, you might have um, multiple protagonists. And so like, um, somebody once gave me a really great piece of advice where they were like, when you're editing, you should always watch it on the smallest screen you can and the biggest screen you can. And I was like, oh, genius. The only thing I would ask is that you wear headphones if you're doing it. Like, that's, that's the only thing I care about. Like, I don't care if you watch my film on a laptop, but please wear headphones. Yeah. <laughs> please don't play it out of your laptop. Then. And, I, and I, I, I think there's something in that only in so much as it's like, yeah, your film like should be able to, like it's less than ideal conditions. Like obviously I wish that everybody was like, you know, watching on a lovely screen. Um, but like, can I connect them to this performance and the story? And, and also I feel like it helps you think about the story as not just being a, a series of ideas um, about something that a character has to go through and, and what impact does that have on, on the body and the soul and the heart. Um, and just, yeah, just connecting to that, do you know what I mean? I hardly use any wines anymore because of this. <laughs> you know? I mean, if you're lucky, it's a mid. <laughs> um, but I sort of think, do you know what I mean? That's part of the thing of building empathy and building sympathy with somebody's experience other than your own, which I would argue is the ultimate decolonization of the camera. Is It's not, the, the object is not a distant idea. You're like living their experience, right? It's like, we've stopped being the object, we've started being the perspective. And so it's always like, how do I put an audience in the perspective of this character, they've barely, maybe they've never met a person mm. like him. Maybe this is a totally foreign experience to, um, you know, and, and, and it's why I'm not necessarily an essentialist about who gets to tell whose stories, because I think that as long as something is an empathy exercise, as long as it's like I'm trying to bring an audience and myself to this thing, and, and it might be your privilege to do that, right? You might be, you know, like I love Celine Sciamma's film Girlhood. I love that goddamn film, do you know what I mean? Like, she is white and middle class as shit. But, like, I'm like, this is, you can feel the empathy in the way she tells that story, the way she chooses those shots, do you know what I mean? Like, that, those are the interventions um, she's making. That's a very glossy version of what I'm talking about. But I just think, and, I, and actually, I think I feel it a lot when I watch documentaries, and some of you make documentaries, where, like, you can, you can feel if the filmmaker is, like, showing love or like has a slight like sneeringness. I don't mean actively, but you know, there's like a little like, I'm floating above it versus mm -hmm. I'm like fucking in it. And I sort of feel like when you're making narrative film, you've just got to put an audience in it and then let them like, you know, live in somebody else's shoes for a fucking minute. Mm -hmm. I'm just, yeah, I just say in terms of documentary, I mean, documentary film has this kind of like anthropological, <laughs> historical weight that is something that I guess that it actually your films also react against. Mm. Um, and it is possible to deconstruct some of those um, conventions in, you know, in filmmaking language, in terms of filmmaking language, devices. Mm. Um, one of the things about actually Al Jazeera when, when I was there was that they had this kind of like code that um, you were supposed to have some kind of relationship to the place that you were making a film about. They just would not let some random white dude wander in and be like, I want to make a film about Afghanistan. Like, that was not, it was impossible. You could not do that. They didn't do voiceover narration. They really started phasing out voiceover narration. So I never made a film with a voiceover, um, which is, again, one of these kind of like devices of anthropological films, mm -hmm. voice of God mm -hmm. telling you what to think. So there are. Yeah, I suppose like really simple things like that that are ways of you know decolonizing, if that's um, one of the words that you could use to describe it. I suppose in the film that I'm making at the moment, we're using a lot of archive, and that's another thing that opens up a whole kind of set of questions about how you approach images that have always been framed in a very specific way. And the archive research process is so fascinating and so disturbing because you can't. You know, when you start to get into categories, how things have been filed, what labels have been attached to them, where they've ended up. You know, we're trying to find images of like minority communities in Britain that have been here for hundreds of years and you just can't find them because 
they've been labeled as the wrong ethnicity mm. or you know there's like a whole there's so many questions when you get into archival filmmaking that i think um yeah it's well, anyway, it's interesting it's an interesting question i think what happened to the other microphone oh, 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 oh okay <laughs> Um, out of blank. Um, we've got like, two more questions before we um, close out the panel. That's a perfect place. Hey, oh, hey everyone. Um, I was just wondering how you guys, um, if you could tell us about your experiences navigating white commissioners essentially, and as POC or whatever term you prefer to use, um, having basically it feels like, from my perspective, it always comes down to a choice of. Whether you pander in some way, or you feel fit it to something that they would endorse, or like knowing that you were mentioning, like you have a struggle that you're going through right now, and often that's the experience I've had: is either you give in and you kind of make a compromise for or you go the alternative, independent route, and then hope that you can find your own role, like um, route. That often you hope, like maybe the internet, maybe distribution, whatever. But you know, the perils of that is kind of a struggle. You're always having to kind of like, like you were saying, you always just just have to keep going and push yourself and it can be quite a struggle. Um, yeah, so I just wondered if you could talk about your experiences. Um, I'm trying to think. Sorry, I shouldn't lean on that, that's not very COVID friendly. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's full of peril um, navigating whether you are an exercise or an artist um, and you just have to get really good I actually think that quite a lot of commissioners are slightly afraid of me. Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because I do give them quite a hard time. Um, and but I and actually this is something I really um, bonded with Omar about was just like you know from the first meeting we got to know what's you know because because we'd done this big project where we'd gotten fucked over much later in the process. Uh, it made us very defensive in that first meeting. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You go in there and you fucking guns blaze. <clears throat> Because if they don't want, you know, what is it? If you don't love me, it my ugliest. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? It's like you can't, you can't get my Oscar-winning film though. Uh, but um, and and I sort of feel like it sort of sorts the wheat from the chaff. I mean, it's not a coincidence that all my producers are black people or women. Do you know what I mean? Like, it just isn't because um, I was like, here is the thing, here is the value. Are you with it? Yes, great. Um, and I feel like. There's a very big difference between getting a film commission and getting a film made, and my, you know, all of my films are made by the same funder. They're all made by Film Four, um, and that's because that is a group of people that I've met who are committed to my vision as a artist. And I'm like, I've got this thing, and they're like, sure, sure, we'll give you the money for it, which is amazing. I mean, it's a fucking stupid situation to be in, isn't it? Um, but I sort of feel it's, you know, I think I agree with you. It's like um, find those people and just. Stick to them, <laughs> like stick to them, because actually, like there there are companies I don't even bother. I won't even go in for the very first like general because I'm like they made what? No, <laughs> like, we're never gonna see eye to eye. There's no point in us having this conversation. My agent's like great, um, but I, but I just think it's like I'd rather psychologically for myself, emotionally, I'd rather have fewer conversations and have them be fruitful ones with people that I believe to have the same values as me. Than to like fucking blow. And, and sometimes if people are surprising, like I just wrote a project for Disney, I did not expect to have such a nice time. They let me write whatever I wanted. <laughs> it's being made at the moment. Um, oh, I'm not directing it, it was, it's a TV series, it's a heist series. Um, but like I didn't, you know, I went in there very defensive, I went in there being like, mm, why am I here? What do you want? Is it the Muslim bit or the black bit? You know, like whatever. It turned out slightly to be the Muslim bit, but they didn't know that. So I was like, okay, this is all right. Um, but actually, like being just being very tough and not a pro you know I don't mean tough as in being strong because I think that's a problem. But it's like fucking put them under scrutiny and just be like, who are you? What are your values? I don't want to give you my project, actually, <laughs> you know, or whatever. Um, and sometimes you know, like that Disney thing, white showrunner, white very fancy producer, literally like barely got a note because they were just like, we think this is great. We gave you the job because. We do know who you are, and we do. That does align with this thing, you know. My episode's about two um, Moroccan immigrants in, in France, and it's like entirely in Arabic, and 
I didn't expect that. Like, I was so defensive going in. I was like, they're going to make me write some bullshit about how she's X, Y, and Z. They were like, no, we do know who you are. We have, like, this has come with a level of scrutiny from us, too. And I was like, I appreciate that. I appreciate that we have... Do you know what I mean? I think... But it's hard, because, like, you know, you've got to have the conversation. To, I mean, I call all of my friends. I'm like, have you met so-and-so? Are they a dick? Yeah, do you know Because yeah. I don't want to go in that meeting if they're a dick. <laughs> like, I'm just... I'm not bothering. Um, and that's part of what I say about like people not being like Teflon. It's like it's okay to ask other people like, did you have a horrible, <laughs> did you have a horrible time working with these people? Should I not work with them? Um, but you know, it is hard. I just think you can fully fucking like sell yourself and be a cheap ass hoe. That is like fully whoever's this it like you know buy yourself a house through Marvel. I think, that's, but like as long as it makes you like happy and you're not going home to cry and every night, that's okay. Do you know what I mean? So just like. You know, I was fascinated. I've got a friend who's currently directing a Marvel film, and she's like, Nadia, I'm having a fucking freakishly great time. <laughs> like, <laughs> everyone is so nice. And I'm like, well, then that's amazing. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? It would make me really sad if you did this huge thing and sold it yourself out, but we're having a horrible time. That'd be awful. Um, so I just think it's that. I just think it's like you're going to spend many, many years working with these people. And if you have even like a kind of little nugget of, you know, resentment or doubt or, you know, whatever, or they say something very slightly racist to you every so often, like, get the fuck out. There's somebody else who will make your film with you and it may take you 20 years, but, like, park that project and, you know, protect yourself. Just protect yourself, because, you know, otherwise it's really hard. Thank you, would you like to add anything? Um, no, I think that's all very good advice. I think that, I think... The, the worst answer you can get from commissioning editors or funders or whatever it is, is, uh, is maybe, you know, mm -hmm. that they're sort of interested. And I found out over the years that those are, they're going to waste the most time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was really genuine, I felt that in my chest. They're, like, yeah. yes. <laughs> they're relationships that you'll yeah, be emailing yeah. them for years asking for feedback and they're going to keep dragging you along. So, you know, a few years ago I realized my my pitches, because you're pitching all the time, were much better when I just told the truth. And I, I really presented the film honestly the way I was going to make. Uh, w was no longer trying to please everyone, because that's also, I think, part of the problem. And you get 99% of the people who say, uh, no, it's not for me, or I don't get it, or whatever. And then 1% who love it, and they're really going to be involved in the project, and they're going to make the film with you. But those people who don't know, who aren't sure anyway, most of the time they don't want to say no because they don't want to have accidentally rejected the next Oscar winner or BAFTA winner or whatever it is, or that it becomes an amazing project, so they want to wait to see a rough cut or whatever it might be. But those aren't the kinds of people you want supporting your project anyway. And certainly you don't want people who support your project despite who you are. You want people who support a project because of who you are. So, uh, so I think, yeah, I mean, everything that was just said, but that's all I would add on top is that you, you never want the maybe answer. It's the worst, biggest waste of time you'll ever have in a meeting. I was just ask how they respond to your work. Like, the number of me have been in, and they're just like, I just saw your film, I loved it. And you just, the next question should always be, why? <laughs> like, do you right. know, just like, let's have a fucking conversation about that. Do you know what I mean? Right. And it's uh, just like, oh, and then you're like, you didn't watch. Oh, like, you watched it in the bath. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, I think that you have to know where you're going to make, where you have to know what the game is if you're going to play in this industry. And that, I mean, I have a really great producer, Elham Shikofa, on the fun that I'm working with, who you guys know. Mm -hmm. And she's amazing. I mean, I definitely wouldn't have made five, you know, I wouldn't have carried on making this film if it wasn't for her. I mean, if you can find somebody that you work with who has integrity and will protect the vision of what you're making, then that counts for a huge amount. Like, how many levels of the, you know, so, like, that exec or that funder who you're like, he's kind of a dick or he's kind of racist or whatever, but, like, yeah. how involved will he be? He comes back around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he comes back around and he edit And suddenly that person's opinion matters and you're like, no! You know, because you're like, but my producer is amazing and I'm like, my, what do they call it in COVID thing? Is it Zone A? Like, my Zone A's, they all, um, you know, I love them, they agree with me. And, but I just think it's, like... You know, director's cut is a fucking rare and beautiful thing. So actually, like every 
layer of and it's really difficult when you're like um, like my film that I'm making at the moment one of the producing partners are also sales agents and so it's all about like they're slightly like how are we going to sell it here and how you know how can we get it into as many regions and I'm just like no <laughs> I cannot make a film like this yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah. actually they, they're like okay cool we'll just, you don't need to be part of those conversations <laughs> but yeah. and I'm like yeah I don't I actually don't it doesn't matter to me what the guy in sales thinks right now when I'm trying to cast a film and he tells me that this actor is more valuable than the actor or wherever and I'm just like but honestly if you saw those actor value lists you'd kill yourself in general yeah. you're like who's a C who's an A <laughs> oh do you know I mean and the, you know and they inevitably blame China for being racist mm. against black people but more on that another day um, <laughs> but like these things do matter you know so actually I was like it does matter what the sales guy thinks because when I made this film he's going to come back into play and I need to be really sure that he gets what is important to me about how this film gets treated. That has to be part of the making of it. So like that just required me like stealing myself and being like, look, you're gonna have to talk to this fucking idiot and you're gonna have to, who is probably very good at his job. I'm not saying he's not fantastic at his job, but actually appreciating that every single part of, you know, because well, there are so many like film marketing gaffes that we've obviously all seen. And you're like, yeah, that's the peak moment that your film meets an audience like that in many ways it becomes the most important way that your film so that has to matter every moment of it has to matter so i think you know um although i fully you know this, a lot of this conversation has been about collaboration and collective and like there are real points in the filmmaking process where you're like it's all on me because um like suddenly you realize you're the one having to like you know like as the kind of central um figure you know, you're having conversations with fucking like marketing people months after your editors left, you know, and you're just like, oh, I like that bit. And now, you know, we're sitting here arguing about which poster is gonna, you know, whatever, you know. Um, and that's really, that's, that's to me has always been the harder part, is less about the making of, or even the funding of, um, and more about the it meeting an audience on terms that do not compromise. You know, I, I remember seeing Moonlight like before it was in cinemas and, and meeting Barry Jenkins and mainly thinking he was the best moisturised man I'd ever seen <laughs> um, and smelt so good um, and I was like, you know, well, good luck with this film <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he was like, yeah, I'll be happy when it's um, in the neighbourhood cinemas and I was like, I think that's an amazing goal, I think that's an amazing, yeah, it's not about it going to you know, your cousin, your picture house, whatever, it's weirdly about it going to multiplexes because mm. now it's ironic that it required a huge amount of commercial success in order to, do you know what I mean? Uh, sorry, critical success and all of those things and all of those engines are like fully flawed. Um, but like, I was fucking ecstatic for him, right? I was like, yeah, I went to like my grandmother's local cinema and yeah, it was, you know, and I was like, that is fucking great. You know, so I sort of think it's, it's just having a level of control well, not control, that's not the right word, like, um, like being the vector mm. through every bit of the film. Thank you so much for that. One last question before we close off. Oh, I thought of something else. Can I add something really quickly? Just as a, uh, I think sometimes also there are projects that work really well within that system of funding that need it, for example, or that would benefit from a long development process or a development lab or this pitching process. And there are others that I think are much more valuable just done on your own with a friend uh, and, and a cheap camera and you make it and it's something you want to see done. But you know that either it won't fit any of those boxes, so it's pointless, or it's so precious to you, you don't want to share it, or you really want to do it now and you can't sit around waiting for funding. So there's, you know, we, we talk a lot about are you are a commercial filmmaker, are you art house, are you in the gallery? But the filmmakers I love most now, that I really admire, they, they work everywhere. Some, they're making a book and then they're, they're doing photography and they make a weird ad for perfume and they get paid five million dollars to shoot an ad for Gucci and then the next day they're making a really obscure art house film that no one ever sees and they, they, you can choose which space that project is going to live in. So I think too often we try and cram our weird idea into a blueprint that's going to fit a funding schedule. But it doesn't have to. Not every project needs that process. You see what I mean? Can I just follow up on that? But I do think if you do just make it yourself. So for example, with Stockholm, it wanted us to have super five presenters 
film about this Iranian poet, it didn't work, we said no, and then we decided just to do it independently. And we are like, we'll put into festivals. But actually, the number of festivals we got into or even looked at is actually, there's a good deal of openness and it isn't as open as people say this. Does that make sense? So it's like, what distribution models do you use? How do you... Did you, see, did you see then? that Zia Anger film, my first film? You seen no. that? Seen that? No, I missed oh, it. Oh man, that was like that was one of the best things I've ever seen, and it's exactly about that. It's yeah. like you know, she made her first feature film. It's like some three-hour magnum opus, yeah. and then she sent it to all these festivals that didn't get it into one. But she turned that into the genius of this is that she not only turned it into a live event, but then because of COVID, she turned it back into an interactive film event. And I was like, you are my absolute hero. <laughs> but I think I think there's something about like that, like it's constantly in a creative conversation with itself, right? That you're just like, actually, that the act of it not getting into festivals makes it something mm -hmm. else. And sorry, that's just what that made me think of. Yeah, I mean, it sucks. <laughs> but yeah. I would say also, uh, what I'm describing is you make something completely outside of the system for yourself, mm. or you make something in a more conventional way. So what I, I'm, I'm not critiquing how you made that film at all, but you went from making something for yourself then trying to integrate it into the conventional system. So, but I, I, I'm not talking about that because that system is really a pipeline. And most of those festivals, anyway, they're looking at projects that they've already been following for seven years. So I'm talking about something totally outside of that. Like this, I'm making a magazine now that's only going to have 100 copies and that's it. And people will own it and it will be a nice object. It's not going to make any money at all. It has no distribution at all. But it's something I really want to make because it's a beautiful thing and I love printed matter. So it, it, it will exist completely outside of the conventional corporate structure of cinema making. Do you see what I mean? It's that trying to bridge the two that can be really dangerous. And also then your priorities change completely because like you said, if you make something out of love, the, uh, the thing that makes you feel good about it is that it represents something, an idea that you had. When you start sending something to festivals, suddenly the validation is external. It's a completely different project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got one last question at the back. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, everyone. It's been a brilliant panel. Um, my question is, do you believe, and this is to all of you, do you believe in the radical possibility of cinema? Do you think it can affect materially the lives <coughs> of racialized and oppressed people? And secondly, like, can you just tell us some of the filmmakers who have influenced your work? No, you won't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I'm, I'm going to start by plugging the film that's on after this, which is Sandy Zane. Yeah. Which is hopefully so good. will stay and watch. Because um, Sandra Muldoro is a filmmaker who definitely um, inspired me. She definitely is a political, a big P, mm. Marxist uh -huh. filmmaker. Um, and I think that actually, and some of the other films that you've shown this weekend, Sam Ben, um, these kind of filmmakers of third cinema, mm. like for me particularly, um, important, um, and they definitely used cinema as an explicitly, um, you know, revolutionary tool, weapon. Um, and of course, it's possible because <laughs> they did it. Um, so yes, I do still believe it, even if I might not ever make another film. <laughs> Please I'm make another film. It's not fair. I'm probably make. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope it's clear by now that I do. I do believe in the revolutionary potential of cinema. But, and I think this is where the dialogue often falls apart, I don't mean by that that you will watch a film and tomorrow we'll all be out in the streets mm -hmm. with pitchforks. <laughs> because it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. It's not that we watch cinema as a blueprint for how to stage a revolution. It's that the cinema nourishes something in our souls that we desire to see and be seen. We desire to see the world in a particular way and share that vision with other people. So in the same way as poetry can inspire, as painting can inspire, as a political speech can inspire, you know, unless I'm making a manual for how to take over the streets, I, I, I'm never making a film to explain to you through information how to stage a revolution. But it's a film about, in the simplest level, my own awakening to that possibility. And like I said about my students, if I feel that way, I believe other people feel that way. Uh, but I feel very lucky, in a sense, as a Palestinian, because I have a cinema history where militants literally went into battle with a camera instead of a gun. So, you know, there is 
there's a, there's a heritage there that I feel I've inherited, and it's very powerful for me. It's a way of saying that the camera is a weapon, and it can be used to fight a revolution. But it's not an instruction manual. I don't know what I believe, man. Um, ambiguity. I'd be, yeah, right. Ambivalence. <laughs> oh, no, what is that? Ambivalence, that's the one. Uh, I believe in ambivalence. Uh, <laughs> no, I, it's interesting. It's, a, it's really interesting what you say. I feel like um, you're very lucky if you come from a country that has a cinematic history. I do not come from a country. Mm. I come from a country where, you know, an increasingly Islamist dictatorship destroyed our cinematic history. And if you've seen the excellent documentary talking about trees, mm -hmm. You know, that was, uh, you know, my parents <coughs> used to run a illegal film club when I was a kid. You wow. know, we used to smuggle VHS in. And then we'd have to, like, put it in and wait for the title scene because I'd be like, oh, Blue Velvet. And, and like, <laughs> the VHS, the VHS goes away how old uh, I am. But, you know, yeah. and so I did not grow up watching the film of my own people. I grew up watching American, French, English cinema. Um, and I sort of feel like, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily believe in... Um, cinema being like one to one connected to change. I think I think that was a excellently put point. I believe in making things films empathetically, and I believe that increasing the level of empathy in our daily lives through our interaction with any art, not just film. Film has a remarkable way to do it because you can literally be like eyeball to eyeball with somebody, um, and it's a collective thing. If you go to the cinema, and, you know why do you do that? Um, so I think that it makes us more like pliable to giving a shit um, you know I think all these things are true but what I will stand on because you make an excellent point with um, Sam Zanga is that you know my life changed massively when I found myself able to watch African cinema of the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. there was me before that and there was me after mm -hmm. that because part of the uh, very rich fuckery of colonialism and I say as somebody who grew up in a colony um, is that you are totally disconnected to the people who came before you. you know? So you always feel like you're starting a conversation. Actually, that conversation has been had for decades. And even, you know, for me, it was the filmmaker Med Hondo. I saw a Med Hondo film, my, my life changed. I was like, here's somebody who has, like, exceeded my radical expectations, and this <coughs> film is, like, 50 years old. Um, and once I'd seen that it had been done before, I knew I could build on it. And so actually my like great is, you know, it's interesting because my, my husband works for the independent cinema office and actually they put out um, Mandarby, they were part of getting that into local cinemas. And he was like really, he said, I've got it in 65 screens. I was like, yes, do the damn thing. Um, is that my like great, like, what I want to do is make fucking, fucking fuck tons of money. And then I'm going to be like Martin Scorsese and just go around getting like digital remasters of all of these amazing, because like the Sam Bazanga yeah. thing, like I've seen the original one where it's like pink, the whole film is pink. I just watched that remaster, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. This is like one of the most amazing films I've ever seen. So like my great passion in life is finding old films and like making sure, I don't care if they go to streamers, I don't give a shit, do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I don't care how they meet the world, but to me there is no, that's what, you know, that's why you can be a white filmmaker and feel confident in that first meeting. You've seen fucking thousands of films your whole life made by people who look like you. Mm -hmm. And actually I feel like to me there's something about giving exactly that depth of like people like us have made films for most of the cinema century from all of the cinema century actually do you know what I mean and so actually I think although I could like talk about filmmakers today that I'm really excited about what I'm interested about is the archive and actually just making people like Sam Bazzani was weird because I was like a girl a girl made a film do you know what I mean? Like, what the? Because I was like here being like, mm, Sam Ben, Sam Ben, my Betty, all these like nice men. Do you know what I mean? And then you're like, a girl one? And it, poof, you know, your, your life changes again. So I sort of feel like that's the, you know, it comes back to the thing I was saying about collective, like understanding that you were part of the collective of history of people who maybe have some similar experiences um, to you and, and taking strength from that. And um, that is what will put us on the strongest foot moving forward is understanding where we have come from. So, you know, watch old films. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, thank you all for joining us. And, uh, you know, a special thanks to our esteemed panel. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.